of the Beats. The Beat Talk for You Radio. What's going on, brothers and sisters? This is Brother Stanley Sylvain of Sin No More Ministries. I'm letting you know that every time I'm not putting together some lessons to, to bless the people out there, I am definitely listening to Sal Showtime and Debate Talk for You. God bless you all. Peace. That dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk View Radio. All right, thanks a lot, Sal. And first of all, let me say all praises to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to all the brothers just joining us on this particular platform. And I appreciate you. Uh, giving me an opportunity to come back to your platform. I never think it's a light thing. Actually, I'm honored. What we're going to be talking about, as the title said, is Annihilation versus Eternal Torment. So we want to just lay some groundwork. There's a couple of things, you know, that I want to cover. I want to cover the overview. I want to cover, you know, Annihilation as viewed in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then I want to throw in some quick arguments, and obviously I have to break that up in a different section. So I'm going to going to jump right into it. Now, annihilationism is the view that whoever and whatever cannot be redeemed by God is ultimately put out of existence. So let me just go ahead and say first to the audience is that my entire life, as far as, you know, my old paradigm of being a Christian and being an Israelite as well, has always been eternal torment. But I had to take a look at it, you know, one day and just say, you know what, let me go ahead and examine it. You know, each doctrine, doctrine by doctrine, I took a look at that just like anything else. But dietary law, holy days, you know, animal sacrifice, I wanted to look at everything. And so I had to start dealing with this as well. So I'm going to go ahead and take the position of annihilism. And so now let me go ahead and continue with it. Sentient beings do not suffer eternally as the traditional view of hell teaches while I'm not completely convinced of this position, I think it's worthy uh, for serious consideration. That's why I wanted to go ahead and do this. Now, while the Hellenistic philosophical traditions generally view the human soul as inherently immortal, Scripture sees immortality as something that belongs to God alone. And so I want to go ahead and get some of the Scriptures that say that. So if we look at 1 Timothy 6 and 16, look at what it says here, guys. It says, who only has immortality, describing, you know, God? Who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom we honor and power, who we honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, in fact, the Bible says that we have to be made immortal. Consider 1 Corinthians 15 and 54. It says, so when this corruptible shall put, have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Let's go with Romans 2 and 7. It says, to whom, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Let's go back to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 and 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, Whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So having an immortal soul is a completely unbiblical concept. Immortality is given to us. In fact, that is the gift. So those who choose to reject God's will are denied this gift following the pattern of Adam and Eve who rejected um, God, denied God access. It, God denied them access to the tree of life in Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Now, unfortunately, some, but not all, early church fathers, air quotes there, accepted the Hellenistic view and consequently read into Scripture the view that the wicked suffer unending torment. This became the dominant view of hell throughout church history. Now, if we read the Scripture without this Hellenistic assumption, however, we see that it teaches that God justly and mercifully annihilates the wicked he doesn't subject them to eternal torment. Now, Scripture certainly teaches that the wicked are punished eternally, but not that the wicked endure eternal punishment. The wicked suffer eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46, eternal judgment, Hebrews 6 and 2, eternal destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, 
the way the elect experience eternal redemption, Hebrews 5, 9 and Hebrews 9, 12. The elect do not undergo and process of redemptions. Their redemption is eternal in the sense that once the elect are redeemed, it is forever. So too, the damned do not undergo an eternal process of punishment or destruction. But once they are punished and destroyed, it is forever. Hell is eternal in consequence, not duration. The wicked are destroyed forever, Psalms 92 and 7, but they are not forever being destroyed. Along the same line, scripture references to an unquenchable fire and the undying worm, and it refers to the finality of the judgment, not its duration. If we look at Isaiah 66 and 24, it says, and they will go and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not quench, be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Now, again, that's not the King James Version, but it reads pretty much the same. If we look at Jeremiah 4 and 4, it says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. So the unquenchable fire is nobody can put it out. When God puts it on, no one can put it out. If we look at um, Jeremiah 7 and 20, it says, Therefore, this is the sovereign Lord, says, My anger and wrath will be poured out on this place on man and beast, on the trees of the fields and on the crops of the land, and it will burn and not be quenched. So, again, that's an unquenchable fire, unquenchable fire. Um, Ezekiel 20, 47, 48, it says, Say to the southern forest, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to set fire to you and will be consumed and will consume all the trees, both green and dry. The blazing flame will not be quenched. Again, it is mentioning unquenchable fire. Now, if these passages are read in context, it becomes clear that the fire is unquenchable in the sense that it cannot be put out before it consumes those thrown into it. And the worm is undying in the sense that there is no hope for the condemned, that it will be prevented from devouring their corpse. These passages teach that the wicked will justly suffer for their sins, but the end result will be their destruction. So there's your forever all right, now let's take a look in the Old Testament a little bit. The traditional view that the wicked suffer eternally makes little use of the Old Testament. Now, defenders of the traditional view justify this on the grounds that the Old Testament authors weren't concerned with the afterlife. Now, annihilationists believe that this approach is a mistake. The Old Testament actually has a good deal to say about the ultimate destiny of those who resist God. Peter specifically cites the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a pattern of how God judges the wicked. The Lord turned the inhabitants of these cities to ashes and condemned them to extinction, thus making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, what it says in Second Peter 2 and 6. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So if he gave us that example, if he says look to that as an example, if we go to some Sodom and Gomorrah, what are we going to see? Ashes, sulfur. But is that destruction eternal? Yes, it's, it's done. They are burnt up. So conversely, the Lord's rescue of Lot sets a pattern of how the Lord will rescue the ungodly from that trial. In Second Peter 2, 9, we thus have a precedent set in the New Testament for learning about the fate of the wicked in the Old Testament. And what we learn is that they are condemned to extinction. Now, throughout the Old Testament, the Lord threatens the wicked with annihilation to all who refuse to comply with the covenant God has established. For example, the Lord vowed to blot out their names from under the heaven in Deuteronomy 29 and 20. Indeed, he vowed to destroy them and light the land like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which the Lord destroyed in his fierce anger, Deuteronomy 29 23. So, too, through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord warns that, Let's take a look, Isaiah 1 and 28. He says, rebels and sinners shall be destroyed together, and they who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Ye shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. The strong shall become like tender, and their work like a spark. They and their work shall burn together with no one to quench them. So it's, again, unquenchable fire. Now, the, if we look at these metaphors that is spoken of in the Old Testament, they all denote 
total annihilation. Consider this other passage, Isaiah 5 and 24. It says, a fire devours the stubble as the tongue of the fire divides the stubble, and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their root will become rotten, and their blossom go up like dust, for they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts. Okay, so look at that. Look at that metaphor right there. Now, the theme that the Lord will annihilate the wicked is especially prominent in the Psalms, and we're going to look at a lot of Psalms uh, throughout the course of this uh, presentation. The Psalmists say that, that whereas those who take delight in the Lord shall be like Trees planted by streams of water in Psalms 1 and 3. The wicked shall be like chaff that the wind drives away. The wicked will perish if we look at that. So uh, Psalm 1 and 4 says, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. They shall be dashed into pieces like a potter's vessel, torn into fragments. Uh, Psalms 50 and 22, blotted out of the book of the living. Psalm 69, 28. Each metaphor depicts total annihilation, like they're not going to be here. Now, similarly, the Lord's plan for evildoers is to cut them off from remembrance from the earth. Evil brings death to the wicked, Psalms 34, 16, and 21. The wicked shall be so thoroughly destroyed that they shall not even be remembered, Psalms 9 and 6, where it says, Endless ruin have overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished or 34 and 16. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth, meaning they are gone. In the powerful words of the author in Obadiah, if we look at Obadiah 16, something is said here. It says, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Now, I want you guys to imagine if someone is burning continually without end, how are they going to be forgotten? How are they blotted out? If you're looking at them right there, they're writhing and suffering in hell. Now, again, I'm not saying that there is no hell, and I'm not saying people are not going to a lake of fire because I'm saying quite the contrary. We're just talking about the duration. That's what we're dealing with there. Now, with the same force, the psalmist proclaimed that the wicked will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. They shall be cut off and will be no more. Though you look diligently for them, they will not be there. Psalms 37, 9, and 10. It says, for those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Now, while the righteous abide forever, Okay, the wicked perish like smoke; they vanish away. Thirty Psalms thirty-seven and twenty, they consume away. Matter of fact, it says in twenty it says, "But the wicked will perish. Though the Lord enemies are like the flowers of the field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. They vanish like waters that runs away, like grass. Okay, uh, be trying down and wither like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the untimely." birth that never sees the sun, like the untimely birth that never sees the sun, mean you're not here, you're gone. And again, transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. In short, the fate of the wicked is disintegration into nothingness. The psalmist emphasized on the total destruction of the wicked as parallels throughout the Old Testament. Daniel, for example, speaks of all who shall be crushed by the rock of God's judgment as being broken. They become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor blown away by the wind, so not so that not a trace of them can be found. Nahum say it, says that in the judgment the wicked are consumed like dry straw, Nahum 1 and 10. Malachi tells us that the judge, judgment day shall come burning like an oven, and all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The judgment thus shall burn them up, if you look at Malachi 4 and 1. Even the Proverbs uh, tell us, that all who hate the Lord love death, Proverbs 8 and 36, and that when the tempest of the Lord's judgment passes, the wicked are no more. The wicked are no more. Again, when God's fury rises, the wicked are overthrown and are no more. And finally, the evil have no future. The lamp of the wicked goes out. This is Proverbs 24 and 20. It seems impossible to accept that the wicked have no future if, in fact, they shall re- net it. 
I'm sorry, they shall never cease to experience an eternal future in hell. So, too, it seems that the wicked will be no more and even be as though they never were if they shall be existing in eternal torment. It just doesn't make sense. There's plenty of inconsistencies there. And so in my studies, that's what I come to find out, that there's a lot of scriptures that I would have to flat out ignore or reinterpret without the benefit of context, basically eisegesis for me to continue to believe what I formerly believed. But I know I'm running out of time, so with that, I will rest. Yeah, I would just like to thank my opponent for such a great um, just dialogue in the Word of God. It, um, one thing it did for me is it showed me everything that pretty much I didn't even get ready for in this debate, but the the problem with everything that he quoted is that it was all in this time frame. The Bible says that the things not seen are eternal. The things seen are temporary. When you're talking about Gehenna, you're talking about a temporary place. When you're talking about um, a spiritual Gehenna, you're actually talking about a spiritual place. And I cheated just a little bit because he gave a, a great opening statement with a lot of scriptures. Um, but I have a recorded statement just to make sure I came uh, with uh, a statement that would you know, fill up the timeline. So I'm going to give my statement now. Then I'm going to speak because my statement, I think, is probably pretty much like 10 minutes. And I think he gave it probably like 14 minutes. But one thing you got to remember is every statement that he gave actually was temporary. It was in this lifetime. It wasn't in the time to, to come, actually. So I'm going to give my opening statement, and then I'll do my rebuttal against what he actually said. Here we go. First and foremost, I would like to give praise and worship to the God of all creation, Yahweh, and his only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Holy Bible teaches us that the Father and Son have specific names and roles, which over time have been corrupted and misrepresented. And as debate forums around the world argue the facts and challenge the norm, one thing is for certain, we are leaving no stone unturned. But we must be very careful as we reason the Holy Scriptures not to trample or denigrate God's infallible word. So with that in mind, I would like to explain a little bit about who I am, what I believe in a nutshell, and address the topic outlined into two positions, and why one over the other should be believed. I was a rather rambunctious child. Some would even call me a brat, but nonetheless, my grandmother's favorite little ball of joy. I always wanted to know how things worked and all about that big black book that sat on our living room table for as long as I could remember that had all those beautiful pictures in it of angels and demons and characters like Elijah and Moses and especially this one character named Yeshua, or as the world calls him today, Jesus, and how he alone was responsible for my soul being saved. Peradventure, I took the time to even consider that as an option. Oh, how I love the pages of that book. Day after day, night after night, I was captivated. One day I heard a voice in my head, just as clear as two people talking on the telephone, and this voice asked me a specific question. How do you know that wrong ain't right and right ain't wrong? How do you know that that book is telling you the truth? Well, that sparked some curiosity in my little brain, so I began reading books on ESP and astrology to see if there was any other books out there that had inspired me as much as the Bible did. Soon after that, I found myself lying on the front lawn in a comatose state, totally catatonic, staring off into space and none could wake me up. I ended up on life support, and because my grandmother was a strong believer in the Lord, she said she wasn't going to keep me artificially kept alive, for only God knew if it was my time to go. They had a little prayer and pulled the plug, and all thought hope was lost until I began to breathe on my own. Doctors told my grandmother, who we all called Nanny, that it was a miracle. Because I had gone so long deprived of oxygen, the best hope they had for me, if I did live, is I would be a vegetable. Well, that was over 36 years ago, and ever since that day, I knew I was on God's clock, for it was he that spared my life on that cold, snowy day of 1981. I believe the devil made a play for my life, and I was given a second chance. I could just as have easily died, seeing I was only breathing enough to keep me alive. Time marched on, and I never forgot how precious life was. I always wondered why I listened to that voice of opposition, 
that I personally believe tried to kill me. But one thing was for certain. The Holy Bible was the catalyst that prompted that question from the voice who I later found out to be Satan and the devil. For he posed a similar question back in the garden to Eve. But truthfully, did God say, that old serpent is still in business today, and the only thing that keeps him employed is our unwillingness to repent and fully trust in God Almighty. Now, this event began to shape a certain type of attitude in me as a child, and my teenage years, like so many others, were times on testing ranks, and so in my wild oats, but not as some would like to believe, because I had a very strong undercurrent of conviction that kept me close to that book that I just could not stop thinking about. Not to mention, this was the only book that told the whole story of existence of man and what would befall humanity in the last days. I was born again and baptized when I was 19 years old, but truly a believer all my days. My family was comprised of Catholics and Baptists and Jehovah's Witnesses, to name a few, but none I could remember was an atheist or, or didn't believe in the existence of God. But what was the truth? With so many different opposing denominations, I set out like every believer does that's serious about his walk with God to find out, quote unquote, the truth. It led me to some interesting debates with people who I believed were on the same team as I was, but I really learned over time that these people had no clue what was written in the Bible, and they quoted things that were contrary to what I had learned in God's Word. Did people really read this book and take it to heart, or was this book just the centerpiece of a world of endless disputes and debates, and was this book used as a weapon against others, threatening them with the fires and torments of hell? All I know is this book called the Bible was, or should I say, had to be divinely inspired, or how else would it cause this much controversy? Well, needless to say, I'm a Christian that believes Christianity has been poorly represented and hijacked by the Roman Catholic faith, which is just the spirit of Babylon going all the way back to that character Nimrod or this first demonically inspired king. So, the topic tonight, again, we ponder and reason whether or not these things be true when dealing with annihilation or eternal torment, and what does the Bible actually support or teach? I happen to believe and take the position in this debate that hell is a real place of torment, as told in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and not just a place of sleep. But this is not to be confused with the lake of fire, which we will get into, is said to burn forever and ever. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm told or hear the word twice in one sentence, it makes me think that the one is speaking it, is highlighting it, or trying to tell you something particular and get a particular point across. Not to mention this topic dealing with pain has a very sobering message. And what message is that, you ask? You do not want to experience this fate. I was talking to a man one day, and this character was pretty much getting on my nerves with his nonchalant attitude toward God and the Bible, and ultimately even hell. I preach grace to the humble and fear to those who present themselves properly. I ended up saying, man, do you want to burn in hell or something? You keep playing around with God, and you're going to die not saved, and you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and then you're going to learn. And this is what the guy's response was. Well, let me ask you a question. How long do the fires last? What? Did this knucklehead just ask me how long the fires of hell last? See, if my opponent succeeds on extinguishing the fires of hell here today, I promise it will only lessen the degree by which sinners run from sin and repent. If you were to give people a choice and tell them they could live their lives to the fullest and do as they please with no real lasting consequences for their actions, the majority would rape, kill, steal, and riot without hesitation. Because truly the only thing holding mankind back from total anarchy is the fear of death and eternal torment. And as that certain man asked me that day, how long do the fires last? To him I responded, forever and ever, sir, you don't want to test the true and living God. That man shuddered and shrunk back a little bit that day, and his pride was doused with the realization that he might just find out the hard way if he kept playing around with God. Now, I would love to believe and support what my opponent's position is today, that a man sleeps in the grave, and when resurrected from the grave, that he is judged and thrown into the lake of fire, where he eventually burns up and ceases to exist. But there are too many scriptures 
that we will soon get into that truly do not give me that liberty. Yes, because I have family members and probably some friends that will not be entering into the kingdom of heaven, I do want to believe soul sleep and annihilation is the truth. If I had represented to that man on that day who wanted to know how long the fires last, that he would eventually cease to exist and the flames would eventually go out, would he have second-guessed his sin that day or just took his chances throwing caution to the wind? And by the way, what did that infamous rap group, the Wu-Tang Clan, have a song where they said something to the effect of, we don't believe in heaven because we're living in hell? See, I can't turn down the flames of hell or tell people that the lake eventually burns out. It's counterintuitive to what I preach and believe. I will leave you with one scripture we will talk about in the course of the debate, which is this, Jude one twenty three, And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And at this time, I will turn this over to my opponent, but not before I urge everyone that is listening to consider the scriptures used in the debate tonight and not how eloquently they are presented, because sometimes we know that the truth can be hidden on purpose or a lie so beautifully disguised we miss the dangers involved, just like Eve in the garden. She saw that it was an appealing fruit and ate throwing caution to the wind after questioning God's own motives or intentions. Soul sleep and annihilation sounds great when trying to make an appeal to an intellectual crowd. But I warn you, the same reasoning does not work with cold-hearted criminals. I propose to stop trying to get Facebook friends and the appeals of the masses and get back to the business of saving souls. And I know not a better topic than the flames of hell do just that. Thank you, and here's my admonished brother in Christ. The floor is all yours. Oh, you still got time, so Hunter, that's it. Uh, well, you know, if I have a little bit more time, uh, I want to definitely um, talk to my opponent. And he's really not my opponent because he even expressed that he's kind of on the fence. He's kind of studying this all out. We talked before this debate, and he said, like, if if you can convince me, I can convince you, that's good. Because the Bible says we're supposed to reason scriptures amongst one another. You know, the the key is this. No matter how we look at this, there's going to be some pain involved when you leave this earth and you don't obey God Almighty. So I'm in the um, uh, mode right now of offering fire insurance. Here's the key. No matter what, if a fire insurance insurance salesman comes to you, this is what he tells you. Look, I can offer you some fire insurance, but I'm not going to say that your property will be in a fire. But I have to offer this insurance just in case. Now, you pay this insurance salesman thinking that if I ever had a fire, then I could you know, get back some of my goods and I could uh, pretty much um, start back to where I was before this fire began. Now, as my opponent says, he don't believe that there's no fire at all. Truly, I believe that there is a fire, and I believe it's counterintuitive. To preach that there's no fire, because how are we going to teach people to run kingdom? I mean, from from the fire. You know, um, if you know Jonathan Edwards and um, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you would know that Jonathan Edwards, I think in 1769, he preached to run from the the fire of the Most High, to run from the um, eternal torments that would come if you did not obey God. So. You know, my my opening statement was pretty much 10 minutes, and I have probably five minutes to say one thing. It's better safe than sorry. If If we take the annihilation standpoint, the only thing we're doing is lessening the degree by which we run from sin and we run from eternal torment. So the only thing we'll ever truly do is make us not be more serious. To make us more not be more compassionate toward God and his warnings to fear God and understand that there is a hell coming. Whether you believe it's for a millennial, whether you believe it's for infinity, or whether you believe it's for what, like 
two or three days. So me personally, I don't like pain. And I don't think that anyone should try to count up how many days they have to spend in hell before they die. We should just err on the side of caution and say we don't never want to go to that place because that's a place of torment. And we'll get into those scriptures here in a minute because he offered a lot of scriptures that were kind of temp- temporary but not eternal. He talked about burning up and death and all these things in Gehenna. That was in this lifetime. But the soul is eternal. So when you go to that lifetime, how long does that lifetime? All right. One of the things he just said, he said the soul, the mortal, and stuff like that. Remember, guys, in the beginning, I said that in First Timothy six and sixteen, it, when describing God, it uh, the Most High it says, "Who only has immortality." So we're talking about something eternal there, um, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. And then if you go to, if we back up a little bit in First Timothy six and twelve, he says, "Fight the good fight of faith." Lay hold on eternal life that we are trying to get it. So, no, we are not immortal. If I read to reiterate Romans 2 and 7, it says, To whom, uh, to them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Seek for that. We are seeking for that. Again, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this immortal shall have put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the same that is written, that is swallowed up in victory. We are not inherently immortal. Our soul is not immortal. The gift that the Messiah is coming to give us is eternal life, is immortality. And all the stories and the scriptures that I had given before were examples of what, what, what we're told to look at, a Peter in Jude that says, look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. That's an example. All the parables that the Messiah is, uh, gives us to illustrate what's going to happen is as an example, and what we see in those examples is something being burnt up. That's, I, that's just not my reasoning uh, behind it. It's just being burnt up. See, so many people think that annihilation let the wicked off the hook. Like nothing's going to happen. They also think that, hey, you know what? You're going to burn up in an instant and it's over. They get off the hook. Okay, but there is a there's a duration in there because the Bible speaks of greater judgment. Okay, so with that, let me just simply say James 3 and 1. It says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. Now, I want to pause just for a second. I want you guys to understand something. There is no greater judgment when the second resurrection comes up and all the wicked um, are judged and say, okay, you're all going into the lake of fire, and everybody start burning at the same time, which another thing, just to be clear, I do believe there is hell, and I do believe there is going to be a lake of fire. I do believe the wicked will be thrown in there. I just want to make that obviously and crystal clear. So again, in James 3 and 1, it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. So there is no greater if all the wicked is going to be thrown in the fire at the same time and just burn continually. So this statement would make no sense. Matthew 23 and 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. That would make no sense if there is no difference. Luke 12 and 40. Now, that is, now these two statements are talking about eternal, talking about the other side of this life. Luke 12 and 40. Uh, Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man coming at an hour when thou, when thou think not. But then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all he had. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servant and maiden, and, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware. Now pay attention. And will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now, 
I want you guys to keep that in mind. He'll cut him in sunder and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now look at that. And that servant, in verse 47, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Next verse. But he, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So right there illustrates uh, a difference in degree of punishment. Many stripes, few stripes. This is showing a differentiation, not me. I'm just reading it there. Hebrews 10 and 29, it says how much more, I mean, how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sacrificed in a holy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. But it says, how much more, how much sore punishment. That denotes degrees. If we look at Leviticus 26 and 28, now this is an earthly thing. Okay, I will say that this is on this side of the earth. But look at the difference. It says Leviticus 26 and 28, it says, then I will walk contrary unto you, also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Or in other versions, it will say, I will chastise you seven times more, showing a degree, a degree. So that, that's one of the things I want to point out there. Let me go to a couple things, too, while we're dealing with the subject. In the Old Testament, 31 times uh, it is mentioned Sheol, and that just means grave. Now, in the New Testament, 10 times from the Greek Hades, that means grave. Twelve times from the Greek Gehenna, he brought up Gehenna, which means a place of burning. And then one time from the Greek uh, Tartarus. That's where the uh, wicked angels will be, and that just means a place of darkness. So I just wanted to point out some of those things, and I'll read a little bit more on what the New Testament say about annihilationism. Now remember, the Bible paints a picture for us. It tries to get a picture in your mind. So even if it's talking about something right here on earth, it is how it relates to something on the other side of this life. I mean, even God, even uh, Christ said, if you can't understand earthly things, how are you going to understand heavenly things? But that was the whole reason why he spoke in parables. He gave us gave us something that we can understand to equate and associate for the next life. Now, the teachers of the wicked will be completely destroyed as even stronger in the New Testament, like I said. As in the Old Testament, the wicked are frequently depicted as being destroyed by fire. For example, John the Baptist proclaimed that every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So if we're looking at Matthew 3 and 10, it says the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. If we look at verse 12, it says, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire, with unquenchable fire. Now, remember, when you hear these, look at what it is describing. It's basic English, okay? This adjective is describing the very next word, unquenchable fire, not that the person burning is going to just keep burning. Now, remember, it depends on how long they're going to be there. If we look at Isaiah, now this is during the millennial reign when he comes uh, comes back, our Messiah, he says, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be a whore upon all flesh. As an example, they're going to be sick, they're going to be there burning. Now remember, this is the millennial reign, so just by default, they're burning a thousand years right there. So my point is that they're going to burn until time is up. They're going to be burned until their time is up. Their punishment is done. So it may take a 1,000 years. It may take longer, even in Revelation, where it says, and the devil and hell was thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Yeah, they're not done burning. They're not done. They're, they're punishment. So everyone keeps thinking this annihilation is just, you know, you burn up in an instant and it's gone. I'll, I would ask anyone on the phone, if I told you, okay, you can either burn 500 years or 10,000 years. Which one would you take? I guarantee you no one wants e either one, so it doesn't matter. That duration, just because it's not a time without end, doesn't mean it sounds attractive just because it's a shorter duration. It is about the duration of the time. So it's not a uh, get-out-of-hell-free card or anything like that. Nobody wants any part of hell regardless of how long it is going to take. But for right now, I know my time is out, so I will get back to you guys at the next segment. 
All right, family, once again, it's the Bait Talk for you. Turn into the Lion's Den segment, <laughs> right? It was Bait Talk for you radio. That number is 319-527-6239. Again, we see, I see we have more and more people calling into the show. I see um, 716. I see you press number one. Just stand by. We're going to get to the public Q&A a little later on. But uh, also, Soul Hunter, I just send you the, the Lion's Den format in your uh, messenger. So whenever you get a chance, you can check it out. But for now, uh, we're in a rebuttal segment of this uh, debate. It's going to be 10 minutes each. I'm going to open up your phone line, and you've got it. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for all those Bible scriptures. They're great. Um, we're going to go through Bible scriptures that actually state the opposite of what you were talking about. Uh, there's a lot of them. There's furnace of fire, unquenchable fire, damnation of hell, Hell and fire not quenched and all the above. So I'm going to go through them right now. Instead of actually uh, trying to make what I think the Bible says to be accurate, I'm just going to go through the scriptures right now. We'll let the audience figure that out later. In Matthew 13, 41, 32, uh, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do inequity. And it shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, unquenchable fire. Matthew 3.12, Matthew 3, whose fan is in his, his own hand, and he will thoroughly, flourish, uh, um, thoroughly purge his fleshing floor and gather his wheat into the garner. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, ask the people today, unquenchable fire, and I think my opponent said unquenchable fire is kind of for here and this lifetime, and it's unquenchable, but we eventually burn up. But in the next life, do we actually burn up? That's one thing we have to ask ourselves, because in this life, we agree that hell is um, – it's, it's horrible, and – but the lake of fire is something totally different because hell – and Hades, or however you want to explain it in the Hebrew or the Greek, it was cast alive into the lake of fire. So let's go on with the scriptures and see what it has to say. Hell and fire not quenched. Isaiah 66, 24. And they shall be go forth and look upon the carcass of, of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Their fire shall not be quenched. And this is talking about in the next life, not in this life. Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool. Shall be in danger of hellfire. Now we agree that hellfire is not the lake of fire. So don't get that mixed up. Um, the lake of fire and, the, and hell is cast alive into the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is something different. It happens while this duration of life is taking place. That's hell and Hades and Gehenna. No matter how she old, how no matter how they've explained it. That's cast alive into the lake of fire. So always be aware of the temporary and the eternal. Because temporarily, you're going to burn up. You're just the flesh. You're just flesh. But eternally, that's all we're considered. That's all we are concerned about. Now, my brother made, um, he made a, a statement that you have to be immortal. Well, I, I can promise you that in the next life, when these scriptures that I have to state to you are coming about, that it will show you that it's immortal because the, the word eternal and the word forever forever and ever mean everlasting or immortal. Uh, in Matthew 18, 8, wherefore, if thy hand offend thee or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed. Rather than living two hands or two feet be cast into everlasting fire. Now, I don't know how they explain everlasting fire in the spiritual world. 
Now, everlasting fire in the temporary world, it could say, well, it means everlasting because it lasts for a while until the end of this life is over and then it goes out. But in the eternal world, it doesn't mean that it ever goes out. Like I told you before, no matter what type of evidence you offer before eternity, it's temporary. This is what the Bible actually says. The things seen are temporary. The things not seen are eternal. So if you're talking about a temporary Gehenna, that actually burns up because it's your flesh. If you're talking about the second death, I believe he raises them from the grave in a body format, and then they're sent to what? The second death, right? But that's in a spiritual sense. So let's go to Mark 9:43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. This is the same text. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. I don't think I have to go any further. I really don't. I don't need 12 minutes, 10 minutes, 3 minutes. Mark 9.43 actually states, the fire that never shall be quenched. This is where all annihilists or all people that say there's, the fire is not going to last forever, they, they actually hate these type of scriptures. Because actually, it says never shall be quenched. And you know just as well as I know, there are many more scriptures. He offered like 40 scriptures to my one. And I will say this, Mark 45, verse or, or, or chapter 9, verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So I don't need 10 minutes to expound on Mark 9, 45. It says it never shall be quenched. And that's talking about the eternal realm. That's that's not talking about the physical realm we're dealing with here. So with with, uh, Mark 9, 45, I'll turn it over to my opponent. I don't need to go any further. All right, family. Like I always say, get your pen and pads ready. Hopefully you're taking down some notes and want to hear from you, want to hear some of your questions, your comments, that number to call in, 319-527-6239. So now I'm going to go back to Robert Reed with the second rebuttal part of this debate. That's going to be eight minutes each. We're going to go open up his phone line, and go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to get back into it. He had mentioned something about the fire being unquenchable, and I'm going to agree with him. The fire is unquenchable. It is an unquenchable fire. Remember, guys, basic English. The adjective is describing the fire. The fire is unquenchable, meaning you or I cannot put it out. Period. The wicked will not be able to put it out. While I'm on that, let me go ahead and address the worm that died not, which I already addressed it in my opening statement. The worm will not be stopped from doing what it is doing, which is consuming the flesh. Now, I know there's a word picture there, but it won't stop. The wicked won't be able to do anything to stop it when they are being consumed. In fact, the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire when it says it's in Deuteronomy 4 and 24 and also Hebrews 12 and 29. And it's interesting. I went ahead and looked at the Hebrew for consuming, okay, and it's a call, and it means to eat, devour, burn up, to eat, to eat a couple of times, to devour, consume, okay, devour, slay, devour, consume, destroy, to devour, to be eaten, to be uh, devoured, consumed of fire, to be wasted, destroyed, let's see here, to cause to devour, to cause to eat, to consume, utterly destroyed. Now, I'm going to go, now that was in the Hebrew. I also want to go to the Greek where it says in uh, Hebrews 12 and 29, Hebrews 12 and 29, I want to look at that as well. It says our God is consuming fire. Now, the Greek 
definition. It says here, it's a shorter definition. It is, I cannot pronounce that, but I will try, kat, katanalisko, katanalisko, okay, in the Greek. It says to consume of fire, consume utterly. To consume utterly. That those these are the words these are the words from the Bible. These are not words that I'm just choosing to make up uh, as a descriptive term. Right now I'm using the King James and I'm using the Strong's and that's what these words are. So again, like I said, it, during that millennial reign in Isaiah, it says, Hey, you know, you're gonna go by and you're gonna see their carcass and they're gonna sit there and they'll be burning and rotting. Yes, they are. Yeah. But eventually, they'll be utterly consumed, eventually. But they are, those transgressors, they are going to pay. Now, we understood, like I said, we understood that the Messiah spoke in word pictures, and I was reading a couple of things. Now, look at, again, when he's asked about how, you know, the, the world ends and what happens and what happens in the end, he gives us, and when I say he, I mean the Messiah, he gives us the word picture. This is not me. This is a Matthew 12 and 36, I mean 13, I'm sorry, Matthew 13. Verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. That's exactly how it's going to be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send his send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And what's going to happen? And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Of course there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth for as long as they're in there. For as long as they're burning, they're going to be gnashing of teeth. If I had a big furnace, a big bonfire, a big conflagration, and I threw 20 people in there, guys, you're going to hear some uh, gnashing of teeth, some weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And how long are you going to hear them? For as long as they are alive in the flame. Now, again, I am not saying that when someone is annihilated, it will happen in an instant. In fact, I highly doubt it's going to happen in an instant. When I use the two examples that I did before with Isaiah and what I said is with uh, Revelation, with the um, devil being thrown in a lake of fire with the false prophet uh, and the beast. So, I, so I don't think it's going to happen in an instant. Now, let's see how the now let's see how the Bible compares eternal life, okay, to death, but to what happens. John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son has eternal life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. If you are burning in a fire for all eternity without end, that is life. It's a bad life, but that is life. But this says, see no life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you see a pile of ashes that used to be a person, you are seeing the wrath of God abiding on them, are you not? Okay, I want you guys to appreciate the juxtaposition. Let's go to um, verse 15 and 16 of John 3. That says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. We'll look up perish in a moment. We'll look up perish in John 10. We'll look at that in a moment. But have eternal life. That whosoever believeth. Let's see here. In him should not perish, but have eternal life. I lost my my place there, guys. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life in verse 16. So look at the look at the comparison. But you know what? Let's let's continue. Romans 6 and 23. Now I want to look up I want to look up Parish real quick. Parish. It says Apolu me, forgive me. But it says to destroy, to put out of the way entirely, abolish, put an end to ruin. Render useless. I think we're starting to get the point of what perish means. So Romans, it compares. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Galatians 6 and 8, look at this. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap 
corruption. So we know what corruption, uh, decay, you know, wither away. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. John ten twenty eight. And I give unto them eternal life that they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And finally, John 17 and 2, and it says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So that's what the gift is. Again, as I said before, the gift is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, not eternal punishment. Now, again, I'm not making light of hell, and I'm not making light of the lake of fire. It is a place that none of us should want to go. But there's a duration and a degree of punishment. And the only thing we can determine is not temperature, but duration of how long someone's going to be burning. It could be 500 years, could be 10,000, could be a million. But it just will not be without end. With that, I'll rest. All right, today's debate is entitled Annihilation versus Eternal Torment. My special guest is Robert Reed and the Soul Hunter. The number to call in is 319-527-6239. Hopefully you're taking down your notes as always, and make sure you call in during the Q&A segment of this debate. But uh, we're going to go now to Soul Hunter. Again, we're in the second rebuttal part of this debate. That's going to be eight minutes each. Let me open up his phone line and go ahead. Thank you, brother. Um, I thank you for all that word, and I love it all, no matter how you present it, because it is God's word. Uh, but you, you stated that, you know, we got to know what eternal means. Uh, tormented forever and ever, Revelations 20 and 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I don't think that anyone thinks that the devil is a physical being. I don't think that anyone believes that the devil is here on earth with us now. But he's actually talking about the devil, the same place that people go to. Now, number one, um, God did not create the lake of fire for people. He created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels or those that fell from heaven that had the first rebellion against God, and they followed Lucifer, the illuminated one. Now, let's read that again, because you need to see this, because if you don't see this, you can't see where the other people spend eternity in. So that would be Revelations 20 and 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is not hell. This is not Hades. This is not Gehenna. But this is the lake of fire that happens at the beam of CG, uh, a judgment of God. This is the end of all ends where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So unless you've got another uh, har- hermeneutically correct, philosophically uh, correct argument forever and ever, uh, We can't get past that point, and that's eternal, by the way. That's on a spiritual level. Now, everlasting fire. Let's go into Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand. You know, that's at the end of the world. Depart from me, ye cursed. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I make a proposition to you that are listening to me today. Don't side with demons. Don't side with demonic activity or devils, and you won't have to suffer in an eternal lake of fire with Satan and the ones he deceived. That's the only thing today. You know, my wife said today, she said, don't um, call your brother the opponent. But I have to take a conscious decision to read the word for what it means and to read the word for all its validity. And if we're dealing with the tormented forever and ever, everlasting fire and everlasting punishment, if he's taking the stance that you finally burn out, like I told you before, I'm in fire insurance. 
I'm a fire insurance salesman. I know sooner or later uh, uh, you, you may never need that fire insurance in your home. But if you ever need it, we will pay out. That's what the word of God is doing today. It's a fire insurance salesman. Trust me, you don't want to sell your soul and say that I believe in annihilationism, and then it not actually exists. Because if we don't turn up the fires of hell today, and trust me with this, I've dealt with the hardened criminals of society. I didn't deal with the the intellectual crowd at Yale and Harvard and all these all these colleges all over the world. I dealt with people on the street corners. I dealt with people that ate babies. I dealt with people that killed one another for a living. And trust me, when you offer the Billy Graham message, the Joel Osteen message that Jesus loves everybody and Jesus is going to save everybody eventually, all you got to do is and then he'll accept you into his family and he'll love you and take you into everlasting glory. Trust me. That don't work with these people. We don't turn up the fires of hell today. And we don't warn these people that there's an everlasting fire coming. We lessen the degree by which they run and repent for their sins. Now, everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, 46. Now, this says everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, not the righteous, to everlasting life. Now, the wicked go into everlasting punishment. The righteous, which I don't think we have any uh, a problem with, they go into everlasting life. Now, we don't get down into the hermeneutical type of debates about what that life means and what heaven means. But with this wicked cr- crowd… He actually is – he gives us the actual things that will be happening when they're in everlasting torment. It will be an everlasting torment of fire. Now, I asked you, why would anybody want to put out the flames of hell? Trust me, if you put out the flames of hell, this wicked crowd, this wicked generation we have out here, they'll take their chances and throw caution to the wind, and they'll go out there and sin and do all – that they can because listen they live in hell actually right now i think my my uh, brother in the lord <laughs> actually had a couple couple more minutes so i'll end with this if we turn out the fires of hell these people will take their chances and they will live their lives thinking that i live in hell i live in hell already so what's the big issue? What's the big problem? If I got to live in a little bit more torment till I'm put out of my existence or put out of my misery, that's okay. But trust me, if you put out the fires of hell today, those people will say they'll be lined up around the corner to get into the kingdom of hell. Trust me, because if they don't think they'll suffer for eternity, they'll put a gun in your head in a minute. They'll still rape and kill and pillage in a minute. This is the only thing keeping us from anarchy and civility today. Don't put out the fires of hell, brother. All right. Uh, thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Once again, that number is 319-527-6239. I don't know what just happened there, but um, I guess we're all kind of here to do a radio check. Hold on. Let me make sure everybody's here. Mm-hmm. Rob, you still there, Rob? Okay. I'm still here. You got me? All right. I got you now. All right. So we're going to start the third rebuttal, part of this debate. I'm going to open it. It's already open. (laughs) You can go ahead. (laughs) All right. Well, you know what? My opponent, uh, since it switched from a fact check to debate, my opponent mentioned the word forever a number of times. And so I I want to deal with that. I want to rebuttal with that. Um, Now, for instance, Hannah pledged to God that she would take her infant son, Samuel, to serve in the temple at Shiloh, where he would abide forever, okay? And I wanted to look at some of the words uh, that are there. Forever says long duration. I'm in the Strong's, okay? So in the Hebrew, it says long duration, antiquity, uh, future, futurity, you know, old, ancient, ancient time, long time, 
Um, same thing with Jonah. He says in two, uh, Jonah 2 and 6, he says, I went down to the bottom of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So we all know that Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, but he described it as forever. So the same thing can be said if you were burning for three days or burning for two weeks or a month. It's going to feel like forever. Okay, so we wanted to look at that. He also said over in Revelation 2, actually 20 and verse 10, I believe. Yeah, it says, uh, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, which I brought up before, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, okay? It is a, look at it, the Greek again, ahion, ahion, forever or broken age, perpetual, perpetuity of time, eternity or period of time or age. For a period of time of age. Now, I told you it was the millennial reign when in Isaiah you will be looking at their carcass burning, okay, and there'll be a hoary to all flesh. Flesh, that is a period of time. That's a thousand year millennial reign. So, someone will be burning a thousand years, for example, for a period of time. That's what we're talking about. Indeed, more than 50 times in the Bible uses the word forever to mean for as long as time lasts in that specific case. Even today, the term is used colloquially to describe a downpour or a hot summer afternoon that went on forever or whatever. I mean, you can be on a car trip or something and your kids are crying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's taking forever. Okay, so it is a period of time. Right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and keep going on with what I was going to say. Let me get back to it. We talk about the degrees of punishment. So there's levels to it, basically. We I talked about that you know, immortality is with God alone, is with the Most High alone, not for anyone else. So I'm going to continue with some of the information that I have. So I'm going to just go ahead and pull it out. I was talking about in the uh, New Testament there that the New Testament has many other types of describing the fate of the wicked, all directly or indirectly speak of total annihilation. The wicked are sometimes depicted as being consumed by fire. Okay, in Hebrews 6 and 8, but the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Given examples, it's given examples that, that we know that the scripture gives us examples, earthly examples that we can understand so we can understand what's going to happen in the eternal. Okay, if we look at a couple of other places here, uh, Isaiah 33 and 11. You conceive chaff, you give birth to straw. Your breath is a fire that consumes you, consumes you. Now, we read perish, read consume, that consumes you. It is frequently said of the wicked that they will be destroyed. Jesus contrasts a wide gate that leads to destruction with the narrow gate that leads to life. Now, he's talking about the other side, where he's going to lead you to. Lead to life means the eternal life because we're alive right now. So he's talking about that leads to life. He's talking about the eternal life. And when he says leads to destruction, we're talking about the other side of this life, that particular destruction. Destruction clearly contrasts with life in the passage, okay? And that at least implies cessation of consciousness, such as when a person is dead. It means you're gone. I read all those scriptures where it uh, juxtaposed eternal life with death or eternal life with destruction or eternal life with perishing. Along similar lines, Jesus tells his disciples not to fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10 and 28. The implications are that God will do to the soul of the wicked what humans do to the body when they are killed. And this implies that the soul of the wicked will, go, will not go on existing in a conscious state after it has been destroyed. That's what it. That's the comparison. We're just looking at the comparison language without any biases whatsoever. Now James teaches that God alone is able to both save and destroy. James four and twelve. Peter teaches that destruction awaits false, greedy teachers in Second Peter. Second Peter two and three. And Paul teaches that the quest for riches can plunge people into ruin and destruction. 1 Timothy 6 and 9. 
Moreover, all our enemies of the cross have destruction as their final end. Philemon 3:18 and 19. It says, "For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things." Okay, so that one's a NIV, which I'm not a big fan of, but I had to read that really quick. So, too, if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person. Again, destroy. With the same force, the apostle teaches that sudden destruction will come upon the wicked in the last day. Sudden, First Thessalonians 5 and 3. This day is elsewhere described as a day for the destruction of the godless, Second Peter 3 and 7. These passages seem to contradict the traditional view that damned souls are, in fact, never destroyed, but rather endure endless torment. It just doesn't add up to what the scripture is saying. All we're doing is looking at the word picture that the scriptures are giving us. The New Testament also frequently expresses the destiny of the wicked by depicting them as dying or perishing, a a polyme. John proclaims the good news that God sent Jesus so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life, like I said in John 3.16. And Paul utilizes the same contrast when he states that while those who proclaim the gospel are the fragrance of life, to those who are being saved, they are the smell of death to those who are perishing, 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. I know I'm running out of time. I will get back to you guys with the information that I have. With that, I yield. All right, family, once again, you're now listening to Debate Toffee Radio. That number to call in is 319 527 Six two three nine. Remember, if you have any questions or comments during the public Q and A portion of the show, feel free to call in. Once you call in, you got to press number one, and that lets you know that you have a question. Today's debate is entitled "For Those Who Just Joined Us: Annihilation Versus Eternal Torment." You have Soul Hunter versus Robert Reed. Again, that number is three one nine five two seven six two three nine. So we're going to go into the third rebuttal part of this debate. And after this, we're going to the course examination part of this debate where both parties will ask each other questions. I'll, put, I'll change it up a little bit, but every change things on the spot, it's going to be more of a dialogue session, you know, conversing once in, you know, with each other. And, uh, of course, we're going to lead off with uh, Soul Hunter. But before we go there, we're going to start this third rebuttal part of this debate. All right. And go to Soul Hunter. Where are you on the switch? I see you. <laughs> All right. You got eight minutes. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh you know, I, w- I would still like to talk about um, how my brother in the Lord always mentions a temporary thing. He doesn't mention an eternal thing. He talks about the parable of the sower, or not the sower, but the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And he talks about how the rich man was, uh, he died and went to hell, and how this, the poor man, he died and was in Abraham's bosom. Uh, let's look at eternal fire. Jude 1 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example. That's an example to us to follow, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Again, it's eternal. See, I get hit a lot of times when I'm dealing with people. They hit me with a lot of scriptures that are that are kind of giving a scriptural uh, uh, interpretation. It doesn't mean forever. But I kind of think that anybody that's listening today would, would believe that forever and ever means forever. So let me read that one more time before I go back into what I have to say. Jude 1, 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, is that not America and every other nation out here today, and going after strange flesh, that's doing whatever your fleshly desires wants of you. You do it. You partake and you do as you feel like doing, are set forth as an example. So Sodom and Gomorrah was an example to you. How many years later? Probably 3,000, 4,000 years later when this was written? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You say, well, Sodom and Gomorrah was a place. And they burnt up one day. So they do not exist like Gehenna 
or the or the, uh, the the valley of skulls and the valley of bones does not exist today. But remember the scripture I told you that the things seen are temporary. The things not seen are eternal. So if you're talking about typology, if you're talking about getting a representation of what the eternal is talking about, the physical, the physical burns up. You're right. My my brother in the Lord said it burns up. Every time you look at it, it burns up. It ceases to exist. But in the spiritual realm, does it cease to exist? Preach fear. This is what the Bible said in Jude 1, 22 and 23. 22 states, and of some have compassion, making a difference. So if you go and preaching the gospel to people, and they, they are nice, kind, lovable people, you don't have to preach fear or torment or hell or anything to these people because you can probably get to them with the Joe Osteen, uh, Billy Graham gospel, and that's a great thing. That is actually a heart that hasn't been calloused or hardened by all these things of life. But listen to what he says about the other people. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You see how I can use two scriptures in Jude 1, 7 and Jude 1, and 23 in the same prophet, a minor prophet of the Old Testament. And how I can use two scriptures and rebut all that's given to me with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand scriptures and tell you it's better to be safe than sorry. I told you I'm not selling anything but fire insurance. I would love to believe today. That when people die, they go to the grave. If they suffer there or or so sleep, that's cool. But if they go to the eternal lake of fire, it says eternal, by the way, that they would burn up for whatever infraction they had done on this earth, whether they killed, whether they raped, whether they stole, whether they lived their life in fornication or adultery, and they lived, say, uh, in that torment of flame for 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. And then they burned up, that would be fine because I have people that are going to that place that will not listen to me. But with scriptures like Jude 1 7 and Jude 1 23, it doesn't give me that liberty. Dating to tell these people to fear me. And listen, if you tell your children today, you need to obey me because I'm your father. If you say, look, look. If, if, if you don't even obey me, I'll still be your father. You can cut up. You can steal my car. You can go out there, burn my house down. You can make my family name, uh, uh, disgrace my family name. It doesn't matter, and I'll still love you. Those kids, honestly, when they're reveling or in a state of rebellion, they won't listen to you. But if you tell them, I'm going to lock the house down. You can't come back in. I'm going to call the police on you. I'm going to lock the car up. I'm going to take your keys. I'm going to do all these things I can do. And by the way, if you keep acting like this, you know what I preach, the kingdom of God and his word. And the Bible says if you get past this life and you live in total rebellion and then you die, my God's going to come for you and torture you in eternal torment. If you do not obey your father, I will tell you this. If you tell them that no matter what I do, I'll love you, no matter if you're gay, no matter if you love to kill, no matter if you go out there and live the way you want to, um, I'm always going to love you. Don't worry. I will never cast you off. You'll always be a child of mine. That's not biblical. That's not the biblical statements or the biblical view that God's word gives. He states that if you're not his, he will cast you off into everlasting destruction, everlasting torment, and everlasting fire. Now that, my friend, is something to be feared. And what does the Bible say? First and foremost, fear God, for that is the beginning of wisdom. And with that, I'll turn it back over to my brother in the Lord. Uh, wife, family, hopefully you take it down some notes. As always, take down your notes and make sure you call in. That number to call in is 319-527-6239. If you're just joining us, today's show is entitled Annihilation versus Eternal Torment. That number to call in again, 319-527-6239. You can call in via phone, call in via Skype. 
and press the number one if you have any questions. So we're going to go right into the cross-examination part of this debate. Being that we made some changes right on the spot, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm just going to have them more or less speak to each other more in a dialogue rather than have the usual cross-examination format. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, Sohan to lead with a question, and it's going to be more of a conversation between the two. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make it uh, – let's make that uh, – I'll make that about 15 minutes here. It's the you know, 15-minute dialogue asking each other questions, cross-examination. <laughs> All right, so we'll make some changes on the spot right about now, right on the great talk radio. So let's get this started, and after that, I'm going to go take a eight-minute intermission break, and then when we come back, we're going to go to the people out there that got questions, and again, make sure you call in. Well, let's start this cross-examination. Let me open up the phone lines, and so, Hunter, you can ask your questions, brother. You got a dialogue. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Can I can I ask uh, you yeah. based on something you just said? Yeah, you can ask me a question, definitely. Okay. You would you just brought up uh Jude. Uh so I'm gonna go back to that part where you read in Jude. You said even and verse seven, Jude verse seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set for forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I completely agree with you on suffering eternal fire. However, they said that's an example, and you said it is being, and the scripture says it is burned with eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah burning right now? Uh, no, it's not. But but they, it was burned with eternal fire, so it shouldn't be ending. We should see it burning right now, right? Uh, definitely. Now, if but well, but we, but we number don't one, why is that? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was a temporary example of something that's eternal. And when you when you read the scripture, the things not seen are eternal. The things seen are temporary. So if you see something in heaven that's that's spiritually eternal, he makes a liking to it in the physical realm, such as fire. Does fire burn forever here? No, it does but not. This, but in heaven. But the, no, well, I was just going to say, but the fire that was used to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah was eternal. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah was an actual city, but the fire used to destroy them was eternal. We should still see that eternal fire right now. It should well, burn without ending. Well, we can't because the, – well, the things today are temporary. That's why he gives scripture for our learning, and, and, and we expound upon it. We understand that things here are temporary. We understand, we understand that things there are eternal. So when he gives a liking to something temporary, he gives us an example. And then when he says this will be likened to things in the eternity. Now let me ask you, if there's an sure. eter- or, or, is there an what? eternal Gehenna scriptures that he gave? No, Gehenna is just a place of burning. Well, it's an example of something eternal. Yeah. So let me yeah, ask you another. Yeah. Sure. Temporary life on earth, you have a temporary life. And then he talks about life eternal. The temporary life here, how long does it last? Well, on average, 80 years. Okay. I mean, the Bible says, so you know, we're to live 120, but we know the average person is somewhere around 80 years, depending on. Well, the after the law, but they actually live to be 600 years. A thousand Methuselah lived to be one thousand nine hundred or, or one thousand. No, 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 no one got over a thousand. No one lived over a thousand. Well, unfortunately, the Bible says differently. But how long do you think they lived in the Old Testament? They no one. Well, no one lived. Unt, uh, no one lived over a thousand years. They were, in fact, how about we just go ahead and look at it real quick, Methuselah. Since we all agree that he was the that he was the oldest. So Methuselah right, right. in the Bible. He's reported to live nine hundred and sixty nine years. So no one no one no. lived over a thousand. Okay. Well even with if we say a thousand, you stated that here, you know, it's temporary. Mm-hmm. But yeah. there it's eternal. So how long do people live here temporarily? You're talking about today? No, well, even back people then. People live on, on average, uh, well, on average 80 years. So biblically, you said, you know, we're going to not live past 120, but on average right now, we live about 80 years roughly, give or take. 
okay, in the next life that's eternal, how long will they live? They will continue to live. They will not die e- at all. It will be eternally. <laughs> well, that's your answer. You're talking about, you're talking, no, no, no. That's, the, that's, that's eternal life. You're talking about the gift, okay? Only those who are his get the gift, which is eternal life, which I pointed out many times with the scripture. That's the gift. The punishment is death. The wages of sin is death. It says, again, like I said in John 3 and 36, John 3, 15 and 16, why is it – matter of fact, let me just ask you a question. Why is it compared – why is the just position? Why is the comparison everlasting life and no life or everlasting life or eternal life in perishing? And just for the audience's sake, I will go ahead and read that real quick, which is John 3 – uh, 336, it says, he that believe on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believe not the Son shall not see life. What it means not to see life, or if I go ahead and add the other scripture, it says in John 3, 15 and 16, it says that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. So why does he compare it over and over and over again from perishing to eternal life? Why, 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 does, why does the Bible have that comparison? Well, because here we're temporary. Like I said before, I offer the scripture, the things not seen are eternal. Eternity cannot be subjugated to any lexicon, to any dictionary, to anything. Eternal means eternal. So eternal life means eternal. And I told you that the scriptures say the things seen in this lifetime are temporary. They're temporary. They're an example of things to come. And you have mentioned basically that why does he always give a comparison to they shall receive or the second death or something of this nature? But then they off, they often warn you in the scriptures. The things that are coming are eternal, everlasting, never-ending. Why do they do the ever-ending, everlasting, eternal in the spiritual realm if it don't mean exactly what it says and it cuts off at the time of your existence or at the time you burn for a little while according to what sins you committed on earth and then it's over? That's the question I pose to you. Okay, I'm sorry. Ask your question. I'm sorry. Ask your question. What's your question? I didn't mean to cut Why you off. Go ahead and ask make, your question. Okay, no problem. Why do they make parallels in this lifetime if it has not an everlasting consequence in that lifetime? What is everlasting considering that this life is temporary? And if that life isn't eternal, why ever make the comparison of eternality or eternity if this life is temporary. Why even make that comparison, brother, if there is no life that is eternal? Okay. Okay, brother, you are you okay, you're you're actually making my point because my original question was why in these scriptures that the scriptures compare everlasting life to shall see no life? They compare eternal life to perishing. They compare everlasting life to perishing. If I go to Romans, they said the wages of sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So you keep every time I bring that up, then you say, "Oh, well, this is temporary," and you're talking about you know eternity. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the scriptures that is trying to tell us what it is like in the next life. And in the next life, there is perishing, and there is eternal life or everlasting life. Now, let me ask you this question. If on the other side for a minute, if you, if, if you lay down your position just for a second, and you can pick it back up after you answer the question. If you lay down your position just for a second and someone burns, and let's just say they burn for, say, a 1,000 years, and then they burn up, they're gone. Is that not everlasting destruction? Isn't the result – just like Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't the result everlasting? Well, you made an illusion before that if you was in torment for so many years here, you would say it felt like eternity, but that's temporary. Let's go to Matthew twenty-five forty-one. 
Then shall they say unto them on the left hand, depart from Mm -hmm. me. You agree. This is an eternity. This is about to be – this is the door to what we're opening up to eternity. This isn't here. Ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And what I propose to you today, this um, lake of fire was never proposed to humans. Agreed. God actually made it. Do you believe that the devil and the angels are what you're called demons now that fell from heaven? Are they mm-hmm. eternal or temporary? They're they're immortal. Angels are immortal. Demons are not. Now, if the angels are immortal and the people mm-hmm. that do not obey God go to that fate, how long do they burn? Until they burn up, until it's done. Until God decides brother, to put them out. Brother, that is an ICD statement. You are bringing that in. Listen, I just brother, asked no, you. I, hold on. Time out. Time out. Time out. One second. One second. First of all, I answered the question clearly. You asked me how long will they burn. I'm saying until they burn up. So I did not use any isogesis. Second, I asked you a question. I said, is the, and you didn't answer it, so I'll ask it again clearly. If you see ashes of what used to be a human, is that result everlasting? Is that and, – and, and God is the one who does it. I'm just a presupposing. I told you to, to just lay aside your position just for a second. If you, you're looking at a pile of ashes, it used to be a person, isn't the result just like Sodom and Gomorrah? So, this, so, so I'm not stretching it. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, as you tells us to look back at and Peter tells us to look back at, is the result everlasting? That's a simple yes or no. Is the result of that everlasting? No. So that so they're gonna all come back. Sodom and Gomorrah is coming back, and uh, anybody yes, else they is burnt up. They're, going, they're coming back. back. They'll come back in the judgment of the Most High God when they lived here on this life. That's, they were temporarily judged. When they get judged just, in the next life, they will be eternally judged. That's two separate things. Let me tell you, you when you're resurrected, you're resurrected with another body. By the way, yep. So the first, know body, that. second body is the second death. It says in the Bible that if you take part in, part in the first resurrection, you're that's great. But if you take that's part in the second mm-hmm. resurrection of what death? Now that's the death of your body, but your eto- immortal soul lives on. So that body will die in the first death. And it won't live again until – I'm not sure where you're at on this – thousand years after the saints are raised. You know, that's the thousand-year millennial reign. That's, that's a whole other topic. But let's just say that the, the saints of old uh, – well, not the saints, but the wicked of old get up after a thousand years. And then they're cast alive, the Bible says. Cast alive into the lake of fire where they are tormented forever and ever. Now, did this lake, by the way, it was not created for human beings. It was created for Satan and his angels, which you agreed are immortal. Now, I asked you how long that lake would burn, and you said, well, forever. Then I asked you how long the people that were cast in that served the beast – that served the false prophet, that served this entity called the devil, and you said, they'll burn up. Now, you got to offer scriptural proof for them burning up and in an and, and, and eternal hell. And brother. An eternal. Okay, brother, hold on. You're misrepresenting me. When you asked me how long the angels will burn, I told you that they are immortal, Okay. But I, you are ignoring the scriptures that I, uh, that I read to you that humans are not immortal. In fact, immortality is the gift, which is the gift that, that the Messiah is coming back to bring people. Okay, so angels are already immortal. They're already immortal. And matter of fact, like you said, um, Daniel 12 and 2, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, 
and some to the shame and everlasting contempt. Again, the result of their destruction is everlasting. That's that. I think that's what you're avoiding to answer. But I, d- don't misrepresent. I did not say, well, you know, I don't know that they're different because I'm admitting that both are immortal. No, I'm saying very clearly for the audience, angels are immortal. So they will burn a lot longer, pr- probably for eons. I don't know, they, for eons. But I'm saying the result of the wicked, meaning people, meaning humans, who come up in the second resurrection, their gift is not life. It says they will see no life. So they will be alive long enough to serve out their sentence of burning, however long that is. I am not softening hell, and I'm certainly not softening the lake of fire. Some people... You have a guy who sins and say, hey, he, I don't know, back in the day he stole a couple of sheep. And then you have a mass murderer. I'm thinking the mass murderer is going to have the greater judgment and who will burn longer, okay? But I'm, I'm just going off what the scripture is clearly illustrating. And, and, and the other thing that I, I think you are misrepresenting is that anytime I give a story in the Bible or a parable or something like that, it's as though you're making it like I'm making it up. I'm not making it up. That's what the Bible is saying. And they use these stories and parables to illustrate to us what it will be like on the other side. So it's not on me that the Bible says, oh, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at that. That's an example. And then I said, okay, it's burned with everlasting fire. That's on the other side, okay? The fire that we have today is not everlasting fire. I can make a fire in my kitchen. That's not an everlasting fire. But a fire that comes from God, which is exactly what came, what killed or destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that's an everlasting fire. And then you admit it that that fire is still not burning. And when I ask you why not, you're like, well, you know, this life is temporary. No, the fire is an eternal fire. The fire itself, not Sodom and Gomorrah, that's temporary. That's carnal. That's here on earth. But the fire that was used to destroy it is from something else, the Father. That's what I'm saying. I just wanted to be clear on that. But I know we're running out of time. (laughs) Yeah, we got one minute left. Well, well, thank you, brother. Okay. Well, well, number one. I want to accept you as a brother and say I love you in the Lord because uh, one thing we had to talk the other day, and you basically said, look, I'm going to take the annihilation standpoint. You take the eternal judgment. I'm not going to pull any punches and all that stuff, but we know today uh, you're talking about immortality, and you're talking about angels. They're immortal, and mm-hmm. I would like to believe. I told you. You actually said to me that day, you said, hey, if you can convince me. Don't worry, because I'm kind of on the fence with this, and I haven't really studied yep. it uh, thoroughly. Yep. If you can convince me, and I'm good with that. If 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 I can convince you, you're good with that. Like I told you before, I sell fire insurance. I'm never going to tell someone I'm selling fire insurance to. I can promise you 100% that someone or you're going to have a fire because <laughs> you would conclude at that point that I'm sending someone to your house to set it on fire. But I would say just in case of fire… Um, here's a policy where you can uh, recover all your belongings. Now, those belongings are temporary things. Those belongings are material things, right? But we're talking about a spiritual place. We're talking about a spiritual life that you can't recover those type of things. So you're talking about the angels? Brothers, I apologize. We ran out of time for that particular segment. However, we're going to take an eight-minute intermission break, family. We're going to take an eight-minute break, and when we come back, we're going to get some questions from the listening audience out there. If you're listening on social media and you got a question, you're listening on Blog Talk Radio, just dial that number, 319-527-6239. And when you dial that number, you got to press number one, and that lets me know that you have a question. Again, if you can dial that number, you got to press number one after and that will let me know that you have a question. We're going to take an eight-minute break right now, and when we come back, we're going to go to the people out there, hear what you guys got to say. Don't you go nowhere. Stand by. We'll be right back. Stand by. Welcome to the Planets of the Beats. 
the Beat Talking Radio. All right, family, welcome back to the Lions Den segment right here on the Beat Talking Radio. Today's debate, once again, is entitled Annihilation versus Eternal Torment. We have my special guest for the first time here, Soul Hunter versus Robert Reed. Like I always say, hopefully you take down some notes. You took down your notes. Now it's time to ask your questions live. Again, that number is 319-527-6239. Once you dial that number, you got to press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. You can also send me an email for those who don't want to call in that are shy but still have a question. Send me an email at debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. That's debatetalk, the number four, and the letter U, at gmail.com, and I'll gladly read your question to my special guest, and we can get some answers for you. But let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to... 716-541, you're live on air. Thank you for taking my call, Sal. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to um, uh, thank the your two guests for this topic. I guess I have a, a, a comment um, regarding the lake of fire. I heard the two gentlemen going back and forth at each other. Now, I'm sure that both of you do realize that the Bible was written literally, figuratively, symbolically, and metaphoric. Now, the lake of fire, um, like my brother was saying, that's not for us. That is for the, the angel will be thrown in the lake of fire. We did not inherit that death. We, from Adam in Romans 5 and 12, we inherited that. The lake of fire is not for us, and you will not be burning forever and ever because when they get, when the angels, it says that they will be burning forever and ever. Um, the lake of fire will always be eternal. It will always be open, you know, just in case, you know, after the thousand years or whatever and somebody don't get it. You know what I mean? It'll always be reserved. It just means the second death. But no, no one's going to be burning forever because if you're a spirit, you're, you you can't die. So actually the angels that are in bound in chains of darkness, they're not burning. They're just bound, and they, they're waiting to be thrown in the lake of fire. The the lake of fire is symbolic, and no, you will not be burning forever and ever because you can't kill a spirit. All right, let's let uh, Soul Hunter respond. Go ahead, you can respond, Soul Hunter. Uh yes. Um, she said you can't you can't kill a spirit. That's right. You know, if you're talking about the angels and Satan, they're cast alive into the lake of fire. They burn forever and ever. But those that worshipped him, the Bible says, will be cast al- alive into that lake. Um, like I said before, I'm not the person that's here dogmatically trying to make this fit so I can burn sinners in eternal torment. That's not me. Actually, I deal with more people today I don't think will make it. So I hope that that is true annihilation. But one thing that you cannot get around is the scriptures that talk about everlasting, eternal. They talk about all these things after the fact that they're away from this world or in this scripture, which I don't even really need to go away from. I got probably 20 more where it states in Matthew twenty five forty six, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Who is he talking about? He's talking about that those that were on his left hand. That's not here. That's then. So he's talking about what did he say they will be sent into Matthew twenty five forty one, And those and, and, and then shall he say unto them on the left hand, this is not here. This is about what's, what's the door to eternity. This is what he's saying to them. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He didn't say, uh, depart from me into everlasting um, hell. He didn't say you'll be burned up. He said that these people who qualified for this type of position, which is the qualification of the position that the de- the demons and the angels who fell, Lucifer and the, and, and the third part of the angels that he took with him, 
It states that those people that followed him that did not do God's will will be cast alive into that lake. And I think you already stated that that lake, eternal. But you, but um, uh, uh, my brother definitely said that um, the gift is eternal life. Well, that's true, and that is the gift of eternal life going into eternal life with God. But we have to take these scriptures for what they're saying in Matthew twenty five forty one. I don't need to go away from this. I had like twenty, but I'm finding this to be very enlightening. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, who are those people? Those people that didn't make it into the kingdom. He shall say to those people on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed. Why were they cursed? Because they did not follow God's word. They did not obey God's word on earth, which is temporary. But the things seen are eternal into everlasting fire. And what was that everlasting fire prepared for? It wasn't prepared on something temporary or typology or the Bible that was speaking in metaphor. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, and guess how long that lake lasts? Eternity. And that's what I'm saying. I can't reconcile in myself with scriptures like that, that it is going to burn up eventually. It's almost like being once saved, always saved. If I tell people that, then that's kind of a license to sin. If I tell people that the fires eventually burn out, how am I going to how am I going to stop these sinners, these hard court criminals? No, you, no, you tell them the stop. truth now. I mean, you you tell them the truth now. Like I said, the the lake of fire is eternal, and after the thousand years, if they don't get it right, it, it's always going to be there. It'll be open for for them now. The death and and Hades. The false prophet, the devil, and the wild beast, they're going into, into the lake. Um, human beings, I guess, will be in torment, but it'll be in, in, in darkness. It'll be like jail. You're not going to burn, you know? So don't tell them that because it's not true. Well, actually, it is true because the Bible actually says that death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. This is okay, this is totally great. different. This is say, why we got to get away humans. from the things. It ain't say and humans, all this har- we, we can only say what the Bible says. Now that reference that's for the said. lake of fire, that's only in the book once, and you'll find that in Revelation twenty Three times. It's, it's symbolic. It's symbolic, right? Well, it's actually written so, three times. Let me jump in. Let me Please jump in. Let uh, Robert no. uh, get in here. Let me let uh, Robert we jump in real quick. Then Rob, you can take some words. That. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I agree with some of the parts um, that the that the uh, the young lady was uh, that the sister was um, talking about. Um, I guess I take exception to a couple of them um, when he says, um, "Then he shall say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels." Yeah. So. What we all agree on is that the lake of fire, the fire is not reserved for humans. However, they will find themselves in the fire. It just was not intended for humans because, you know, they will they, you know, not originally. They're not originally intended for uh, we as humans. Brother, they'll eventually end up in the they, – they will eventually be in the um, lake of fire. So there will be some destruction uh, there. But – I mean, other things I'm not, you know. Hey, I don't hey brother, want can too I much. interrupt you for one second? What what proof do you have of that? Actually, the assertion that you asserted of into what? the Bible, which is Isa Jesus, that they will burn temporarily in the lake of fire. Give me that proof, by the way. Okay, well that well one is Q and A from the audience, but when it says that people or that okay, I'll the audience. What, no, 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 well, no. What no, proof no, do they no, have? How, okay, time out, time out. Just slow down, slow down. Listen, this is what I'm saying. The proof that I'm have is pretty much my entire presentation when I gave you example after example after example, and you dismissed it as, well, that's on this side, but we're talking about eternity. And when I gave you, when I, when I gave you the example of Jude, when it says, okay, Sodom and Gomorrah was burned, and first of all, it said to look at that as an example, and then it said it was burned with eternal fire, 
And then I said, okay, the fire should be still burning because it is eternal. And then you jump from this life to the, to the afterlife and say, well, you know, this side is temporary, but the other side is eternal. But we're talking about eternal fire. You and I cannot produce eternal fire right now to burn down a city, okay? We can produce fire, but we can't produce eternal fire. So, like I said, every example that the Bible gives of each parable when the Lord said the reapers are going to come and cast the, um, the, 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 the tares and burn them in the barn, he's given us this word picture, okay? And when something is burned and consumed, it's consumed. Now, if I were to use, for instance, if I was to go to Exodus 3 and 2 to go with your um, – for your evidence, like this, in Exodus 3 and 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So, when, so we know when you say not consumed, if I ask you straight up what does not consume mean, well, how are you going to answer me? And I'll, and I'll make my point. If I tell you this bush uh, was not consumed, what does that mean? Uh, that means not consumed. Eternal. Okay, that mean, on, on, uh, it was not consumed, this, meaning that we know that bushes that are set on fire takes about, what, 5, 10, 15 minutes to burn completely out. In other words, okay, it was it. burning, but it had okay. some type of spirit thing to it where it didn't burn up. So that actually okay, okay. helps so me. My, okay, but my other point, my other point is – when uh, in other places, when I use all these different stories, in other places, when it says that our God is a consuming fire, if I say consuming, then you're going to assume burning up. And when we check the Strong's and we look at the Hebrew and we look in the Greek, it says it is to consume away, is to use up, to make an utter end, just like perish. So you're so so you're going to go and you're going to admit that it, when I say consume, or the Bible, I should say the Bible. When the Bible says consume, that you are thinking that something is going to be burnt up. If you go to Malachi, if you go to Malachi 4 and 1, if we go to Malachi 4 and 1, matter of fact, I'll go there right now. Malachi 4. Malachi 4, it said, Behold, the day, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud ye and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Okay, okay, that's being consumed by fire. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, consumed, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, I know this word picture tells you that they are gone. Okay, I know that. Now it says, uh, verse 2, but unto you that fear my name uh, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of, of the stall. And ye shall tread down the w- wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Now, yes, that is on his return, we understand that. But again, the language in the word picture that the Bible gives us is that they will be consumed away, that they are gone. When they say, when anytime you ask your question and go to scripture and you ask your question, well, what's going to happen to the wicked? Every time it gives you a picture, they're gone. So do me a favor and show me scriptures where the everlasting punishment is them still alive being punished for a time without end. Because you are assuming, you keep saying that I'm using eisegesis when I'm clearly reading what the scripture is saying and I'm not inferring anything. I'm asking a plain question. Stubble means stubble. Burn means burn. Consume means consume. Perish means perished. It's done. And it's damnation, not, and, and it's punishment, not punishing. As in perpetual. I, I don't see any of that. But if you could kindly show me and the audience where you see a picture. All the examples in the Bible are really alludes to or directly says that it is pretty, you're pretty much annihilated with the pictures. Gone. You're like the branch. You're like the leaf. You're like the grass. Consume away into smoke. You're gone. Vanish. Poof. Now, can you show us in Scripture another example where it stays that way on the other side of this life for a period without end? Sure. I'm not going to go to another scripture because I don't need many. Uh, you okay. said that they will burn up stubble without root. That's in this lifetime. 
You agree with that. I said that. I but said what, that. I don't need – the funny thing is I don't need 30 or 40 scriptures to bring in uh, uh, this debate to show me what the Bible really says because so I'm not bringing in a whole – oh, well, definitely. I gave it to you before, and I'm going to set it up. It's just a one-two punch. It, it's pretty It's pretty. You know, good. It works all the time. It's Revelation 2010. Devil okay. that deceived the uh, – where was okay. it cast into? Stone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How long does that last? Okay. Who now? Who's being who, who's being who's being tormented day and night forever and ever? Now it's being in 2010. It's being the false prophet and the devil, basically, okay. pretty much. He's okay. being okay for the this her intended for human beings. I believe that because I believe God is merciful. But when human beings will go apart from God, never obey his scriptures, go out there and rebel and do as they please, what's mm-hmm. left for them? Eternity. But a place he created for eternity and people that were eternal, not people, but angels and demons that were eternal. And I'll give yep. my second scripture. It's Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, these are people about to enter into this. Depart uh-huh. from me, ye cursed because they didn't obey God's word. They're cursed because they did not follow him. They wanted to follow the devil because they liked to fornicate. They liked to commit adultery. They liked to do all the things that God commanded them not to do. And to what? Mm-hmm. Ever? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Fire. Sir. Sir. You, okay, you're using forever and you're using fire, and I've addressed that. So I'll go back to your Revelation 20 and 10. First and foremost, in that particular scripture, and we'll read it again, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So first of all, this is about the devil, immortal, and he's going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. I have no problem with that. The beast tormented day and night forever, ever, or until it's done. The false prophet, if that false prophet is a human, he'll be there until it's done, okay? Because you are saying that no matter what and no matter which resurrection, everyone is immortal. When the gift is immortality, which, again, you're not addressing. The gift is immortality. But you're saying that now, I do agree that that saints and the wicked will be resurrected. The first resurrection is for those who are his. The second resurrection is for the wicked. We agree with that, okay? But that does not mean when they come up, they are immortal forever because all of the juxtapositions are eternal life or perishing. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Does do you think that forever and everlasting have the same connotation in the Word of God? No, not at all. So the, everlasting. The, 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 life, mm-hmm. That don't mean this. Can you offer scriptural evidence in the Hebrew and in the Greek for that, please? Actually, I can, sir. I, you know what? I absolutely can. When I told you earlier, where is my my notes there? When I told I've you, been watching. Uh, oh no, no, in First Samuel one twenty two, okay, Hannah said that she was going to dedicate Samuel forever. That's in the Hebrew. Now, is Samuel still alive in serving the Lord right now? Still alive on earth? Uh, no, yet, but I'm she, sure he. Okay, but she, but he used no, no, no. Don't, don't go to the other side. I said this side. I framed my question exact. What I'm saying is, in the Bible, she used the word forever because you're stuck on the word forever. She right. used the word forever. Right. Okay. Well, now, ever in the no in the Greek. Okay, in the Greek. Okay, I read that as well for the people. Okay, it says forever, unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity. A period of time or an age, you are ignoring all the other clear examples of what it says. Same as Jonah. Jonah said that he was in the belly of the fish forever in Jonah 2 and 6. So is he still in there? I'm sure it felt like it, by the way. Is he still in there? Is he still in Uh, there? No, he's not. No, he's temporary. Okay, but he used the word forever. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. He used the word forever, like I said. The Bible used, used the word forever like 50 times, and it always was oh, yeah. for as long a t- as a time in that specific case. Right. So the when, you, when you use it, when, life. okay, and every time you use yeah, the word right, everlasting. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Rob, okay. hold on. Let's show Hunter respond. I got an email question for you guys. And again, I'm sorry, go number ahead. one, we have a lot of listeners on the phone lines. We have a lot of listeners on the phone line. Just press number one if you have any questions. Well, well, no, I hope, you yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that there are there are a lot of people responding because I told you before that this topic on eternal torment or annihilation is a big topic. And me personally, all I'm selling is fire insurance. So all I'm trying to do is make sure that the person that's listening, in case there is a fire, is protected on the day of judgment. That's all I'm doing. My brother, the only reason I'm selling it this hardcore is because I am on the fence. I will be honest with you. I hear my brother speaking, and I love it because what he does is he gives me a consolation that maybe my family members or my friends that I've been trying to reach all this time will not burn forever. That's a great thing, and brother, I thank you for that. But when I am a fire insurance salesman, what I'm trying to do is not more or less trying to make my point accurate and beat you in your point. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that these people that are listening know that eternity is a long time. And if you have to burn for a thousand years, 10,000 years, a million years, I got burnt on the finger one day and, and I could hardly take it for two days. I'm trying to find, I'm going, I want to go to the hospital. But we realize that no amount of torment, no amount of torment is easy. I'm just saying stay away from torment at all costs. But if we preach that we can put out the fires of hell, maybe it will make people think that they can still live in their sins and and throw caution to the wind. And even if they die, I told you as the Wu-Tang Clan had a song, we don't believe in heaven because we're living in hell, that gave them – They thought, well, if I'm living in hell now, what does it matter that I suffer a little bit on the other side of here as long as I'll be put out of my misery? So that's – to me, it's scary because what if that does not really exist, and what if there is an eternal torment to those people? So that's my compassion. Okay, let me respond this one real quick, Sal. I had only like 60 seconds. Okay. Good. All I wanted to say is that I think the brother is really – I think he's doing a disservice to some people that are listening. One, I am not selling annihilation like it's a good thing, it's okay, and I'm lessening hell or I'm, I'm short-selling hellfire. I think it's an insult to anyone who's ever been in a house fire or who is a burned victim. They could have been burned for five seconds or 20 minutes, okay, but none of them would say that they enjoyed it. And I don't think anyone's going to say, hey, you know what? Oh, well, I used to think I I was going to burn for all time unending, but I can handle a thousand years of burning. I just think that's insensitive, and I think that's an insult to people who have actually been burned on this side. And I can tell you right now, all of them will tell you that it is not a pleasant feeling. So maybe if you visit some burn victims and, and ask them how did it feel and how long did it feel, maybe you would you know have a little bit more sensitivity uh, instead of implying that I'm short-selling annihilation. I mean, I don't think I can say to anyone on the phone and say, hey, you know what, instead of uh, burning for all time on Indy, you'll only burn a 1,000 years. And they're going to be like, oh, you know what, I'll take that. And then for for you to short-sell and say, hey, if I don't tell people that it's going to be forever with unending time, then they'll go ahead and commit the sin anyway. No, if someone is hell-bent on sinning, they're going to sin regardless, whether it's annihilation or eternal torment. I'll go ahead and get the other questions. All right, family, once again, this is the debate talk for you. Again, hopefully you're taking down you some notes and you're getting the answers that you need. Again, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. Today's debate is entitled Annihilation versus Eternal Torment. If you missed any part of this debate, you can always go back to the website, which is www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash debate talk view, or check out the YouTube channel. Just type in the search box, debate talk, the number four, the letter U, and check out all the archives. You can also go to iTunes in the podcast section and uh, subscribe to the show and never miss another episode with iTunes and subscribe today. We have an email question, and again, our family, I see you have a lot of people on the phone line. Just press number one if you have a question live, but let's go through the email. We have an email from Jake. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> What's going on, Jake? We appreciate your email. Uh, the question is, is, please have your special guest explain what's Hades and Geo. All right. All right. Let's go to, let's go to Soul Hunter. Uh, well, Hades and Sheol, we know that's a temporary place, even if it just means the grave or a place where they're burning at this point. Uh, I think some think that when people die, they go to soul sleep, and that's cool. I don't, I don't even really argue that, even though there's a parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man, go, he dies and he goes to hell. He's buried, and the poor man, he's in Abraham's bosom. Now, when the poor man is in Abraham's bosom, the rich man looks up from hell, and he asks Abraham, allow Lazarus to put his finger in a cool glass of water to, to you know, put a drop of water on my tongue because I'm in torments in this flame. Now, you say, well, this was an allegory. It was pretty much a parable. But I ask you, are parables presented because they don't have any relevance to real life, such as the parable of the sower? Does the sower have a farm? Does he have a mule or, or a horse? Does he have an oxen? Does he sow the field? Does he yield fruit or, or seed? He actually related the parable of the sower to a real-life event. Now, with the parable of the sower or, or the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man, it said he looked up from hell being in torments in this flame. Now, that's one thing right there that – Regardless if it's a parable or not, he's trying to explain something to us. It's torment. And like I said before, torment, when it comes to Hades, Gehenna, or Sheol, we agree that that ends. And then what is cast into the lake of fire? Hell, torment, whatever. All right, so Hunter call this dropped. Uh, when he calls back in, we're going to let him continue. Again, family, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. You know, sometimes it happens, technical difficulties, but once he calls back in, we're going to bring him back to complete his uh, statement. All right, so in the meanwhile, I guess we'll let Robert Reed go ahead and answer that question. Go ahead. Okay, Sal, just, just so I have it right, there's asking the difference between Sheol and uh, Hades and stuff, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, it's um, you know it's mentioned Sheol is mentioned is in the Hebrew and it does just simply mean the grave, and uh, in the New Testament it's ten times and it's Hades it also means the grave to add a little you know more the Gehenna not to digress it, it means a place of burning but we're just going to deal with just uh, Sheol and Hades. I found it interesting that in Job fourteen thirteen and depending on the translation that you use that he said. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou uh, wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath pass. Now, that's the King James 21st century, but check out what it says in some other versions. Um, it says, oh, that you might hide me in Sheol, okay? Or it says uh, in other places, let's see here, in this version here it says, if only you would hide me in Sheol and conceal me until your anger passes, so we see here, uh, it, it, it translates Sheol or grave, and depending on the verse, you'll, I'm looking at, I don't know, about 30, 40 different versions, and it bounces between Sheol or grave, Sheol or grave. Now, now, I want you to consider that Job, who is considered righteous, is saying, hide me in Sheol until thy wrath pass, okay, until he, you know, comes back, you know, the second coming and all that, so he comes and... And, and, and really turn the world upside down. But he's saying, just hide me in the grave until thy wrath pass, until that appointed time. Let me look at it in the King James, uh, Job 14, 13. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me at a set time and remember me. And he's talking about the resurrection, the first resurrection. Of course, if we read more of Job, we'll see that, you know, he certainly believed that he would be uh, resurrected. But to answer the question, it simply means uh, the grave. All right, I believe Soul Hunter is back. You know, it's called, you know, calls drop sometimes. Uh, let's go to the phone lines and we open up his line. Soul Hunter, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> can, you can you hear me? Radio check. All right. So, 
five four zero eight seven seven. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, you talking to me, brother? Yeah. Yeah, who, no, who am I speaking to? Yeah, I got the real disconnected. Yeah, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. You're kind of breaking up. Uh, can you hear me now? All right, that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear the last rebuttal. No, it wasn't a rebuttal. It was you were answering the uh, question. From okay. The, the, the question was Gehenna, Sheol. No, Hades and Sheol. Okay. Hades and Sheol? Yes. Right. Or the, what was the question actually? Was it temporary? They said, What's yeah, the hold difference? on. Yeah, you kind of, yeah, you kind of breaking up a little bit, but let me read it for you again. Let me read it for you again. It says, "Please have your special guest explain what's Hades and Sheol." That's the question. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Jake, for rebuttal, or did you talk about that as well? Yeah, yeah, I apologize, Rob. Can you hear him? Can you hear him? Because it sounds like he's breaking up. Can you hear him, Rob? Hey, Rob Reed, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you? Yeah, can you hear him? Clearly, because it sounds like he's breaking uh, up. Uh, he's me. broken up. He's broken up a lot. Hey, how oh, about man. that okay. call my phone? Yeah, just call, call back on my phone. Yeah, just okay, call I'm gonna do that right me. now, and I'll I'll join you. You can have him talk until then. All right, no problem. All right, as a matter of fact, we. Oh, okay, okay. All right, go ahead, Bob. Uh, I wait, is there another question? Because I, I had already uh, answered the question. Yeah, actually, that call dropped. <laughs> yeah, a lot oh, of calls dropping right now. All right, well, once again, that number is 319-527-6239, family. If you have any questions, you know, if you ever hold your peace, we, you know, after this, once they, you know, come back and they dialogue with each other, we can pretty much go to the final statements if nobody else have any questions. Again, family, this is your time. This is your time. So, again, it's the number 319-527-6239. If it's the first time calling in, you listen to, listen to the show, simply press number one on your phone line, and that lets you know that you have a question. Uh, if you already asked a question, press number one two times, you know, and uh, that'll bring you back in. But uh, we're still waiting for uh, Sohan to call back. All right, somebody has a question, uh, I think. Let's see. Let's see what this is. Let's go to 832-890. You'll have it there. Okay, how you doing, Brother Sal? Hey, what's going on? Uh, not much. I just wanted to uh, first say, you know, shalom to the two presenters that are uh, making their presentations tonight. I did have a question for Soul Hunter. Uh, is he? Have you gotten him back on the line yet, or is he still? Yeah, yeah, I believe he's back on. Let me just check in his line to see if it's clear. All right, uh, five four zero eight seven seven. Let's do a radio chat. Uh, can you hear me? All right, there we go. You're back. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm on my phone right. this time. Okay. Yeah, I'm off all that technology. I'm on my phone, so that go ahead. Cool. Well, someone, yeah, someone has a question for you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the brother mentioned earlier when uh, Robert was asking him about the the ashes in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was also making an, uh, making a reference to the ashes of a person, you know, that had already been judged by God. And the question was asked if those ashes were, you know, if the result of the fire that burned Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the results of the fire that came from God to burn the person to ashes, um, if those ashes would return, you know, back to their original state. And the brother, um, brother soul hunter said, yes, they would. And I, I need him to elaborate on that a little bit more because, he kind of lost me right there. Well, yeah, I, I don't think I said that the ashes were turned back to the original state as much as I said that the states were too, they were, they were not the same. Um, temporary things, uh, they have analogies and metaphors that explain spiritual things of the future. When we look at the word eternal, forever lasting, forever and ever, we don't think if you go into eternity that that's going to ever stop. So, like I said before, I have to argue this point, uh, making the reference to the fact that the Old Testament said, uh, this is like Gehenna. This is like they'll be burned up with unquenchable, unequenchable fire. So they don't never die. You said, well, but they died. They died here. 
And you say, yeah, but it's, it's because it's an allegory of things to come. Everything you see here is an allegory of things to come. Yeshua, when he was here, or Jesus as the world calls him, he was an allegory of things to come. That's why he died on Calvary. That's why he took the oblation. He became an atonement. Is, is Christ a temporary atonement or an eternal atonement? That's the thing that I'm trying to relate, that here it's temporary. There it's eternal. That's what he always gives as a typography of what is temporary and what is eternal. Because Christ is, is let's say we succeed in saying that the eternal flames of hell, the everlasting flames of hell burn out. How do we not know if we use the everlasting uh, uh, atonement will not be temporary as well? So while we're trying to put out the flames of hell, let's be very cautious that we don't end up messing up the fabric of our own salvation and our own eternity that states eternity, everlasting, forever and ever. And that's all I'm saying. I don't want people to burn. I think people think that I want people to burn in hell. I'm trying to get out of hell just as well as everybody else. But it doesn't offer me the liberty with these scriptures to say such things. Yeah, eight three two. You go small. Okay. Now, I don't, I don't think that Brother Robert was saying that you know the flames of hell would be put out. Uh, what I understood him to mean is that you know the effects, the effects of what would happen to things that get tossed in that lake. That's the eternal part. Now, once something is burned up, it's burned up. It's not coming back. Period. And that's the part that's eternal. He's not trying to put the flames out. He's just explaining that the results of that, those flames, you know, whatever is going, being consumed away, that part is eternal. Because, like, once once it's gone, it's gone. You know, it's not coming back. But, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's all I wanted. Thank you for uh, allowing me to address your, your, uh, your panelists, Sal. Uh, thanks a lot, by the way. Yeah, thanks for calling in. We appreciate the questions, most definitely. Uh, Robert Reed, you can go ahead, though. Well, you know what? I like what the sister was saying because that's exactly what uh, I meant. I did not mean – by no means am I saying that the flames of hellfire are going to go out. So let me just make that clear. Uh, the lake of fire, you know, it's eternal flames. You know, hellfire, it's eternal flames, okay, and – when it is unquenchable, when it's internal, when it's coming from the most high, no man can put it out, no angel, because they're going to, you know, the, the demons will be thrown in there and they can't put it out. So no one will be able to put those flames out. There's your unquenchable, you know, cannot be put out. Um, so that's, that's what I meant for and meant by it. And again, as the sister says, she understood me very clearly um, that, um, Losing my train of thought there, that I am not short selling Hellfire or the Lake of Fire whatsoever. I am not. It's not a. I'm not even making it more desirable to be there. What I'm presenting is what the Bible says about it. And with that, we can go to the next question. All right, family. Once again, the number is three one nine five two seven six two three nine. This is your time. If you have any questions or any comments, just dial the person number one. If you're already on the phone lines, it will add you in or send me an email to bay12u at gmail.com. If not, we can go straight to the final statements. And again, well, I appreciate both special guests for bringing forth the information to the masses to go back and go study and do their research. That's what it's always all about on the Bay 12 Free Radio research. And uh, I don't see anybody else pressing number one at this time. So we're going to have to go to the final statements. All right, once again, family, I appreciate everybody that called in and everybody that's listening on the phone, and uh, check out the archives. But let's go to Robert Reed with his final statements. It's going to be seven minutes each. We'll open up his phone line, and go ahead. All right, thank you, Sal. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank my opponent, uh, which we were just having a conversation to begin with, but it changed to a debate, but it's okay. I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank, thank you for taking the um, debate and I appreciate you, you know, uh, participating in that. And thank you, Sal, for you know, inviting me back on and having me on the platform. And I also want to thank all the brothers and sisters out there for, uh, you know, to listen in, whether they listen in live or whether they listen later on. 
on YouTube. I still thank you guys, and I want to, you know, bring out scriptures and things like that to edify you guys. So thanks again. Let me just finish up and uh, with my closing statements and just say, you know, look, burning is burning. You know, whether it's for 10 years or 10,000 years, you know, I don't want to burn at all. I don't think any of us wants to burn at all. It doesn't matter the duration. It's a place that you don't want to be there. It doesn't matter. The Bible um, at least implies that there are, you know, degrees of punishment and considering extreme degrees like in temperature, you know, or the degrees of the flame that, you know, that none of that stuff matters. Okay. Um, I can ask you, you know, what's the difference between 5,000 degrees centigrade and 8,000 degrees centigrade? Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. If you're burning in that, you're not going to feel a difference. Okay. Uh, burning is burning. Okay. But the duration, you know, makes a difference And all the pictures. I want everyone to remember that all the pictures okay, show us annihilation. All the examples, you know, the, the, the reapers grabbing the wicked and throwing them in the barn and, 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 and burning away into smoke and all that, okay, the results of it is eternal without end. You know, once they are burned, once they are done, once the uh, Bible wipes away sin, as it says, once sin will be no more, when you couple these um, scriptures and then look at the mercy of God. Look at that, which we haven't really even talked about, and I'll use that um, to close out. But when we look at the mercies of God, setting a wicked person on fire and burn them for whatever duration, whatever duration, it doesn't matter, for whatever duration, once he puts them out, that is mercy. So if we look at Psalms, a lot of the Psalms, brothers and sisters, um, Psalms 100. Uh, verse 5, Psalms 106, verse 1, Psalms 107 and 1, Psalms 118, um, 107, 118, 136, all of it speaks of how his mercy endureth forever. So if he was to take a wicked person and burn them for 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 years and eventually allow them to burn out, is that not mercy? Is that not mercy? So that, that's my plea and my question to you guys. That is mercy, okay? So if we, if we consider a wicked person centuries ago and he stole a sheep and a wicked person who murdered innocent people in cold blood, sacrificed children, the pagan gods, defiled the most high's holy temple, and cursed the father. Now, you take both the sheep thief and the blaspheming murderer and burn them in eternal fire at the same time forever. What's the difference? What, where's the greater punishment? Now, neither one of us can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that what will ultimately happen to the wicked, whether it's annihilation or eternal torment. Now, my opponent is correct when he said I was on the fence. That is the truth. I've been on the fence about it when I start studying it, but I'm looking at the pictures. I'm looking at what is there. What I had to do when I studied this out is I had to suspend and put down my presupposition. I had to put down my position and said, okay, let me see what the scripture is telling me, which is exegesis. And every time the scripture gives us an example it seems to be a picture of annihilation. Now, however, we can look at the, the preponderance of the evidence and conclude reasonably that based on the language, the parables, the context, biblical definitions, and the character of the Most High, the Bible provides more support for the idea of annihilation than it does for eternal torment, brothers and sisters. Now, just because this is two different doctrines, it does not mean that one that I am short selling one of them. Okay, so the problem lies let me look over here. It really lies in the definition. Um it's kind of lost in translation. The problem we see today lies in English definition, understanding of eternal, everlasting, forever, which is without beginning or end. But the Greek definition of eternal, everlasting, forever is without ceasing until the end. See, there's, there's much evidence in this, and I'll give you an example. Many ancient Greek scrolls contain numerous examples of Roman emperors being described as aenios, the Greek word translated eternal in English Bibles. But all that means is that they held their office for a life, not that the emperor was immortal. See, my opponent assumes that everyone is immortal when the Bible clearly says that immortality is the gift that we should seek after, and yea, immortality is the gift that he says he's coming to bring us. 
and I read plenty of scriptures with that. Dead Sea Scrolls, the wicked will suffer unending dread and shame without end and of disgrace of destruction by fire of the region of darkness and all their time from age to age are in most sorrowful chagrin and bitterness misfortune in calamities of darkness till they are destroyed with none of them surviving or escaping now note that this is saying punishment in hell is without end until they are destroyed so if you look at the juxtaposition eternal life perishing damnation Contempt, it is life and no life. With that, I rest. All right, we appreciate you, Robert B., for coming on the platform. Like I mentioned earlier, to the description box if you want to reach out to Robert B., and also to the description box for Soul Hunter if you want to reach out to him as well. well let's go to Soul Hunter with his final statement. It's going to be seven minutes. We'll open up his phone line and go ahead. All right, brother. Thank you, Robert. Um, exegete the scriptures. Isegete needs to bring something into the interpretation, which I don't believe you did, actually. You, you quoted a lot of scriptures, and that's very wonderful. I love it. Let's go to Hebrews 6.2. Of the doctrines of baptism and laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, this was actually a charge that Paul was accused of by the Pharisees or the Sadducees and the, 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 the people of his time. So that was not a thing that was taught in his time. In Hebrews 6.2, of the doctrines of baptism, Baptisms, of the doctrines of laying on of hands. This is when Yeshua was on the earth. And of the resurrection of the dead, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had different um, thoughts about what would happen when people rose up from the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, this eternal judgment, let's go to Jude 1 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example. Now, this set forth as an example. Why? Because we on earth are living. And it's an example of what would come in the future. What would come in the future if we continue to live disobedient and dishonoring God's word, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, my brother in the Lord always says, yes, that's, that's cool, but they don't have the gift of eternal eternal life. But we know that I just stated that they have the gift of eternal life. If they were cast into the lake of fire, what that was not made for the that was only made for the devil and his angels, but they were cast alive into the lake of fire, they weren't they actually weren't meant to go there. But because they went there, now they have to endure the fate of the one and the God that they followed. And let's go to that scripture. I don't really need to get off this scripture because this scripture says it all. Now, you know that we can take God's scripture. If God comes to you and says, what did my word say? And you say, well, it said that we were burned up eventually. He says, well, what did Revelation 20 and 10 say? And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And he will ask you, what does forever and ever mean? And you say, well, in this life, hermeneutically, according to the Bible, according to all these uh, different types of scrolls and all that, he won't ask you that. He'll say, what does your conscience tell you forever and ever is? And then ultimately you will have to go back in yourself because the only thing we ever do is try to prove the word wrong because we don't want to suffer that. And, and I agree. My body told me that right off the bat. I was trying to go annihilationism until I found this scripture, Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand. I can't get around this one, nor will I even give any other scripture, even though I could give 20 other scriptures. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And I said to myself, if I did wrong and I disobeyed my father and I did not obey God all my life, he tells me that I'm accursed and I am to depart from him. Remember who went into heaven, so those that were blessed, those that obeyed his commandments, those that loved him. They went into the kingdom of God but cursed into a last, everlasting punishment. And what does it actually say? Ever lasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for you, people. 
Stop trying to go there and experience it. Don't sit here today and take our arguments and say, well, one brother said this, one brother said that. I told you for for a truth that I took this state of um, eternal torment. I took this argument only because I only sell fire insurance. And the brother said that I was kind of downplaying him. I, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to make you sound less genuine. But if I'm offering fire insurance, I'm actually, I, I recant that because fire insurance just said we can give you all the things that you've lost in the fire after you've ex- experienced the fire. I'm actually stating now that I can keep you from the fire. Thus said the Lord, if you obey what I've given you here today, you don't even have to suffer the effects of the fire because you will never be in it. So fire insurance, as I stated before, I offer fire insurance only. I'm not saying you'll ever receive a fire in your home, but just in case you can, re- you can get your material things back. Today I'm stating this. God says don't even go there with the eternal torment. You're going to actually burn, according to the Bible, if you ever test God, because he has said he is a God to be feared. And, and he, he's, a, he's a horrible, vengeful God. Now, that's not what society likes to paint of God, but that is what you're going to be dealing with the day that you cross over from this life to the next life if you choose to live in this life as a rebellious creature. 